So this morning, as I've uh, been thinking and praying about what to share on this visit with you, I, uh, I really felt impressed to share uh, a message. I've had to adapt it. But uh, for several years in recent years, our conference sponsored regional awakening nights. I don't know, maybe some of you attended those. Uh, the last one in this area was at the Westland Church a couple years ago. It was all pre-pandemic stuff, so it's been over a couple years already. And this idea of an awakening, a spiritual awakening, has really captured my imagination. Lord, what would it look like to see uh, an awakening of God in our day? Some of us might remember the days when that was more of a consistent experience of the church, when churches all over our nation were thriving, and those days are long past us. We're in a different ecosystem than that one. But awakenings happen in really dark times. Uh, do I need to be the one to break the news that we're living in dark times today? Wow. I think about the, the amount of social change we've seen in the last five years and 10 years. It, it's incredible. So when you're old like superintendent, 63 now, uh, you think about what it was like living in Michigan 10, 20, 30 years ago, what it's like today. It's a completely different world we're in. And I believe that, I believe that the time is right for a fresh awakening of God. Our conference has a shared mission statement that we ask all of our churches to to kind of own and to be a part of this, but it's to partner together to ignite a spirit-fueled movement of disciples and leaders and churches. And we see real traction points throughout our network today where churches really are on fire and they're doing the work and they're engaged in the mission and they're launching new expressions of church throughout their communities. And these are exciting stories. I'll be sharing some uh, with you in just a few minutes. But about four years ago, I read a book called Marks of a Movement, written by an Anglican priest named Winfield Bevins, who teaches at Asbury Seminary, where I received my master's degree a lot of years ago, long, long, long time ago. And uh, in this book, Marks of a Movement, it chronicles the history of what was then a fresh outpouring of God in the early 18th century. How many of you are familiar with John Wesley? Okay, so a lot of us know John Wesley. John Wesley himself was an Anglican priest, part of the Anglican Church in England. 1738, he went to an evening service at a church on Aldersgate Street. Someone was reading the introduction to the Book of Romans, written by a German monk, Catholic monk, about 150 years earlier. And John Wesley heard the message, and God did something in his heart, and he wrote in his journal, I felt my heart strangely warmed. And from May 1738, for the next 60 years of his life, uh, an entire movement swept through England and in the American colonies. As a matter of fact, uh, there was a man named Francis Asbury, and Asbury Theological Seminary is obviously named after him, who was the first bishop of the Methodist Episcopal Church in the colonies. And when he arrived in the American colonies, there were literally several hundred several hundred Methodists in the early 19th, 19th century. That's all there were of us. The Methodist church was just in its fledgling stage. And when Asbury arrived, uh, or I'm sorry, 36 years after he began his leadership ministry in the Methodist church, in 36 years, the Methodist movement grew from a few hundred to nine million people. <laughs> Francis Asbury was the more recognized name in that century than Thomas Jefferson. It's amazing. Think about the power of spiritual movements. When someone's heart catches fire, right? Someone's heart is, is impacted deeply by the Spirit of God and the trajectory changes. So what I'd like to do this morning is to just kind of break down the recipe in the hopes that, well, if we could somehow understand the recipe for spiritual awakenings, maybe we could repeat that recipe and enter into a movement of God in our day. So this first one is someone's heart catches fire with the love of Christ. And this speaks to the importance of spiritual renewal. And so in a little bit here, I'm going to... Uh, 
pause the message, and I'm going to allow you some time to pray. How many of you came to meet with God today, by the way? <laughs> yeah, so we're going we're gonna to allow time for that. And the second part of the recipe is the fire spreads into a local church, and congregational revival takes place. How many would love to see a revival right here at Ferndale Free Methodist Church? Yeah, amen. And so we'll pause at that point in the message, and we'll spend some time praying that God would bring fresh fire, fresh wind here to the Ferndale Free Methodist Church. So someone's heart catches on fire, the first step, the fire spreads in the local church, congregational personal renewals followed by congregational revival. And it's when that happens that the Spirit of God, who is already at work in Royal Oak and Ferndale and all over the Detroit metro area, people are responsive <laughs> and being magnetically drawn. And I'll share stories of that that's taking place right now in some of our churches. And we'll conclude the service asking for the Lord to take this recipe, get it all mixed up, you know, get, get it all. Uh, what do you got to do, ladies? You make a cake, get the bubbles out of the bed or something like that, right, before you pour it in. And just ask the Lord, give the Lord space today to minister to us, do what he wants to do here. So I believe that the time is right for God to sovereignly visit his people in a fresh movement. So uh, we want to ask the first question about personal renewal, and that question is, how's your soul? How's your soul? When the early Methodists in England and America gathered in their Sunday services, they were always, always a part of what was called a band. And a band was a small group of people. To be admitted to the society to be able to come into a worship service, you would be issued a ticket from your band in order to get into church on Sunday. Think about that. How many of you needed, was there a ticket taker at the door today? I didn't see one. And so when they entered into the band, there'd be 10 to 12 people and they'd ask four questions every week. Now think about the price tag of, of sincerity as a follower of Christ. Here was the questions you were expected to answer. And when, you're, when you answered those questions, you got your ticket punched effectively and you could go to church on Sunday. Is this blowing anyone's mind? What are the four questions? Well, here they are. Imagine sitting in your living room this Wednesday night and you've got eight other people there with you. And you have, imagine you're the leader and the eight people from your congregation are meeting in your living room. Here's what you'd ask. What known sins have you committed since last week's meeting? What known sins have you committed since last week's meetings? People would go around and they would share known sin in their life. <laughs> they would confess. Question two, what temptations have you encountered? Anybody encounter a temptation? Today already? I have. I drove here. <laughs> Third question. How were you delivered? Fourth question. What have you thought, said, or done of which you're unsure might be sin or not? Do you have any doubt? Maybe there's something else you need to say. You don't even know if it was wrong or not, but it should be shared and brought into the light. Every week, serious earnest followers of Jesus gathered in the homes in groups of 10 and 12, and they went through that liturgy of questions because they were serious about living a pure life before God. They were serious about personal holiness. Millions of people became Methodists because of that liturgy. It transformed their lives. Now, I joined a band. Actually, I started a band. I think we're over three years now. A number of superintendents from across the country. There's seven of us in the group. We meet weekly, and this is what we do. <laughs> think about the power of that question, the, the, the power of that focus. How many read the book or heard the book Atomic Habits, right? So these little things that we can often just skim by in our lives, but getting down to real, you know, what is at the atomic level of our life that needs to be carefully looked at? 
And I can tell you, friends, sometimes uh, when I go into that Zoom call, I don't even know how my soul is. I'm not paying that careful attention. Matter of fact, I find that's probably my biggest challenge. I'm just doing. I'm just going. And so I'm listening, you know, one, one superintendent will ask another on the call, then, they'll, and then they pray for them, then they'll ask the next person. And all the time I'm, I'm thinking, okay, how is my soul? How, how am I really doing? Do you know how you're really doing right now? So these, these are important questions. Um, some weeks... Some weeks, my soul is doing really great. And some weeks, I don't really know how my soul is. And some weeks, my soul's sick. And I have the opportunity in a safe environment, brothers who are seeking to walk with Jesus like I am, who will receive that confession and pray for me, and say, in the name of Jesus, you're forgiven. I think that's biblical. Isn't there something in the book of James about that? Confess your sins to one another, and you will be what? Healed. <laughs> These are illuminating questions. These are sanctifying questions. These are important questions. And they fueled the Methodist movement for two centuries. And the Methodist movement the most substantial movement of God in the history of the church in the last 2,000 years has literally gone around the globe and continues to go today. It's just interesting to me, back when I was pastoring in the Garden City Church 35 years ago when we were having theoretical conversations about discipleship in a church, I think that's what the mission of Jesus is, right? Go and make disciples. I remember uh, an old guy, <laughs> uh, some of you might have known the name Dick Mulholland, wonderful man of God that was part of my church. He said, you know, I grew up in the Free Methodist Church in the East Michigan Conference back in the day when we had bands. I remember that was what the church did midweek. People got together and we went through those questions. And then he said this, and I've noticed that when we quit doing that, the church has never recovered. Wow. What would it look like for a church to scrap Christian education? Small group ministry. <laughs> and say, if we're going to do one thing, we're going to get serious about obedience-based discipleship. Well, I tell you what it would do. It'd probably prune the vine <laughs> because there are some people who wouldn't feel comfortable, but I'll tell you what else it would do. It'd grow fruit. <laughs> so how's your soul, friend? If you're like me, most days, if someone just says, how is your soul, I, I just have to pause and think. And so for the next three minutes, Carrie's gonna come up on the keyboard and just play something just quietly. And I'm going to ask if you'd even like to uh, make some space. Perhaps you want to kneel in your pew and ask Jesus, Jesus, how is my soul today? So we're going to just spend three minutes right now, and we're going to make space to listen to Jesus help us answer one of the most important questions we could ask ourselves today, and that is, how is your soul? So let's pray.
So spiritual movements require that people know how to answer the question, and they live in an environment where that question is normal, not strange. And where paying attention to the health of one's soul is of paramount importance, because when we as individuals care for our own souls, guess what else we do? We care for other souls well. Amen? Doesn't that just make sense? And so the second part of the recipe is a congregational revival. It seems to be the trajectory of spiritual movements. John Wesley's heart was strangely worn. He was in this group. It was a term of derision in a school called the Holy Club. They were holier than thou. They were just disciplined and earnest Christians. But uh, it, it seeped into uh, and became larger, a growing movement. And so the second part of the recipe is this idea of congregational revival, and that is, what are we here for? What are we here for? Um, when you hear the phrase congregational revival, what, what comes to mind? What, what word would you use to describe a congregation that's going through a revival? Well, I think there's different answers. Some would say it's power. Right? It's characterized by spiritual power. The Holy Spirit comes on believers and empowers them for effective witness. That's true, but I think power is the essence of revival. It's not the essence, it's the outcome of revival. Some people would say uh, it's mission, right? The church is on mission. When the Holy Spirit brings revival to a congregation, the people of God become effective in impacting their, their community, their region. And that's also true, but the mission is not... is is not is the outcome of revival. It's, it's not the essence of revival. Spiritual empowerment, missional traction occur downstream. So what are the headwaters? What's the iris, unmistakable sign that a congregation is being revived? You see the word up there? Say it with me. Love. Love. When a revival comes to a community of believers, it is their love which is revived, not their power, not their mission. It's their love. God's love is the predominant characteristic of a church for one another and for the least and the last and the lost. When a congregation experiences a revival a love, it is transformed. It is deeply changed. Revival brings transformation to the lives of God's people, and therefore, through the lives of God's people, they live for the sake of others. As a matter of fact, much of the, the darkness and the fallenness and the dysfunction today in our world could be boiled down to people living for themselves. Love purifies motivations. Love removes barriers. Love forgives grievances. Love spawns unity. Love generates hospitality. Love frees us from preoccupation. Love prioritizes Michigan. Love is an action word. Love makes us other-centered. Love causes us to leave the 99 to go and find the one. When a revival comes to a congregation, the love of God becomes tangible. You can feel it, you can smell it, you can see it, you can hear it. In fact, a revival is a pandemic of God's love. <laughs> Expressed through the lives of God's people and their relationship to one another and their community. Remember the words of Jesus in John 17 when he prayed for the church and for believers who would come Long after in the generations to come, Jesus prayed in the garden that night, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Just stop right there. And, and what, is, what is Jesus praying our experience would be? How we experience one another? That we may be one together, you and I, just like Jesus is one with the Father. Wow. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them, and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then 
the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. <laughs> That's incredible. The Spirit's sanctifying work in our lives makes love our predominant characteristic because His image is being stamped more clearly on us. This is exactly what Paul prayed for when he wrote, pray, wrote, when he wrote his letters to churches and often included prayers to the Philippians. He prayed, and this is my prayer, that what? Your love may abound more and more. Paul, what are you praying for for the church? More than anything, I'm praying that their love would abound. <laughs> in knowledge and depth of insight so that they may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. To the Ephesians, he said, I pray that you being rooted and established, not in knowledge, but in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Toward what end? That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God? Are you kidding me? Is that even a possibility? That when a congregation is revived, he's not writing this to an individual. The letter's entitled Ephesians. This is a, this is a group of churches in this province of the Roman Empire. He's praying that these churches are filled to the measure of the fullness of God. That's what we're shooting for, people of God. <laughs> That's what we pray for. That's what we give ourselves for. <laughs> to the Thessalonians, he prayed, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your heart so that you'll be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when the Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. So, friends, I've been to all, all of our churches, multiple occasions. Here's what I've noticed. Most of us have all the things we need to run a church. Look what we have. <laughs> it's pretty nice, right? We got projectors. We got electricity. We got furnishings. We got nice lawns. We have buildings. We have technology. We have offices. We have trained pastors. We have groups. We have ministries. We have classes. We have worship services. We even have youth groups. How are you guys? You doing all right? Am I doing all right? Give me a thumbs up. All right, yeah. Because this is the crowd you gotta, gotta connect with. We have vision, we have strategy, we have plans, we hold meetings, we read books, we buy resources, we go to conferences, we hire a consultant, we employ coaches. We keep at it, we stay busy, our calendars are full of activity. But you know what we don't have as a church? Revival. If you're like me, you've been in church a long time. And you probably say, I'd rather have revival than all the other stuff. <laughs> Why don't we have revival? Because we need to experience the love of God afresh and anew all the time. Not just in the past. Not just some historical marker a hundred years and two weeks ago, there was probably some sort of movement of God in Ferndale which caused this church to be planted here. And a hundred years later, here we are. In the history of movements, God revisits places. Aren't you glad he does? <laughs> he revisits places. It isn't our facility strategies or services which are going to change the world, and they're not going to impact this community. Frankly, friends, it's just our love. It's just how well we love. So one of the things that I've noticed in, in many of our churches is, frankly, sometimes the absence of prayer. 
And then when prayer is present, it's, it's, it's prayer at this level instead of this level. Here's what I mean. So uh, some of you might know the Lakeland camp down in Florida. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of good free Methodists retire down in Florida and they move into this, this gated community called Lakeland Light and Life Camp. And uh, I was talking with the last pastor a couple years ago. I was down there visiting. And he said when he got to Lakeland Church, he said we had a prayer sheet in the bulletin each work, praying for people by body parts. Hip replacements. Uh, heart valves. I mean, you know, that was what they were praying about. Well, it's a retirement community. People had physical needs. There's nothing wrong with that. But guess what they weren't praying about? Are you catching this? <laughs> when was the last time that a church said, hey, we're, we're just going to meet, pray for a fresh movement of God here? Well, we're going to do that for the next few minutes. And I'm going to ask you to get way beyond your comfort and mine. I'm going to ask for us to stand. Would you do that right now? And I'm going to ask those of you who, who God is speaking to about this issue right now, lead us out into a prayer, asking God to bring revival here. Ferndale Free Methodist Church, to do something new and fresh here that changes everything in the life of this wonderful church, which is celebrating its 100th year and second week. What would the next year look like if God brought a revival? So, hey, let's not be uh, uncomfortable with a moment of quietness. A lot of times we've got to gather our thoughts, think about how we want to pray. But let's just take a few minutes and have what's called in Methodism, congregational moment of prayer. Let's do that, okay? <clears throat> Jesus, I'm captured by the idea, this term that Paul uses, being filled to the full measure of God. I, I can't even wrap my mind around what that really means. It's beyond uh, our description. It's beyond our ability to understand what would it look like for a church to be filled <laughs> so full <laughs> to the fullness of the measure of God. Lord, we may not know how to really articulate that, but that's a prayer worth praying. And uh, it certainly means that there's more of God here. And so, Lord, I just want to begin this morning asking that this church would receive more of you, more of your love, more of your spirit, more of your work that, Lord, there would be a, a, a greater posture of submission and openness and obedience, Lord, that the Lord Jesus would rule and reign here through the power of his Holy Spirit, Lord, sweeping out any places where cobwebs exist and delivering, Lord, a fresh, rich, vital experience of the Spirit of God. God, would you just come would you just minister in these moments that we pray together? We turn our eyes to you and we call upon heaven to deliver a new work, to kindle a new fire, to bring a new wind here in the sails of the Ferndale Free Methodist Church. And we pray this in Jesus' name in accordance with the will of Jesus. And accordingly, we can ask for this boldly and with confidence. And we pray it now. Thank you for praying. So the recipe, how's your soul? 
congregation, personal renewal, congregational revival, and then community awakening. What happens next? This past Easter, I collected stories from every, uh, every network congregation uh, regarding how God worked during Holy Week in these churches. And I want to read a couple of these stories which demonstrate how this works because this is happening. I'm not, I'm not teaching theory here. I'm telling you that this is happening out there right now. We are seeing this sort of movement of the Spirit of God. So at uh, the Dearborn Church where we'll be worshiping tonight, Pastor Ryan Wilson wrote this story. A woman who's involved in witchcraft came to our church on Sunday. Why would a woman involved in witchcraft come to church? I'll tell you why. Because the Spirit of God's at work in the world. Amen? The Spirit of God is at work in the world. So she's involved in witchcraft. She came to the, the church Easter Sunday. She's a mother of a teen that comes to church. And for the first time, she came to the altar for prayer. This was the first time she has made any steps toward Jesus. That's, praise God, that's, that's an awakening of a person's soul out there in the community who's far from Jesus. And the love of God is drawing. Why did the love of God draw that person to Dearborn Church? Because the congregation was going to receive them. <laughs> See how it works, right? When we're what we need to be, people's lives begin intersecting with us, both here, one of the ladies was just praying, but also out there. Um, at our Detroit church, Pastor Mark Van Valen wrote, uh, a highlight was our Good Friday service. We walked through the crucifixion story from the Gospel of Matthew and lit candles along the way. People came forward to light a candle and then announce out loud, Jesus died for me. This mini testimony was powerful as one by one people came forward. Children with little or no church background homeless neighbors, etc., came forward and solemnly declared their trust in the one who died for them. There's an awakening going on in that neighborhood where our Detroit church is. At our Jackson church, Pastor Jason Engel shared two stories. After our Saturday night service, I was introduced to a family that got connected to JFM through our food distribution ministry. During COVID, an individual from our church made weekly food deliveries to this family who were at that time living in a hotel. So there's a child of God who's going out with the love of God weekly and delivering food to this family living in a hotel room. For 3.5 years, this individual has been meeting with the family, distributing food. I had to read that again. For 3.5 years, this individual has been meeting with the family, distributing food, fostering a deep friendship. As a result of this faithful touch, the family made decisions to follow Christ at our Saturday night service. That's an awakening. Then he said another cool story happened in our Good Friday service. As, this, as their family was exiting the service, I noticed their teenage daughter in tears. As I talked with her about the emotions she was feeling, she said, quote, I had no idea how much God loved me. Her mother went on to tell me that she and her family have never been to church. And this was their first Easter at church ever. Someone should be saying amen. I'm sorry. Think about what's happening there. This church is going out just sharing the love of God because they're full of the love of God. And there's something that the Spirit's doing on the outside, bringing people to church, and they're encountering that love deeply, personally. That's community awakening. Someone's heart caught fire in these stories. <laughs> and these churches are catching fire. They're being filled to the full measure of God. And the Spirit of God is magnetically bringing people into these churches. Kalamazoo Church pastor Craig Watson wrote this week, we had another great turnout for Celebrate Recovery. Over 70 people in attendance. We continue to see and hear great life-changing stories occurring through this ministry. It's a church of about 70 people, and every midweek they have about 70 people who are coming in with all sorts of hurts, habits, and hang-ups, and their lives are being changed. And finally, Pastor Steve Gly from our Ipsy Church wrote, quote, one of the church members heard about a young woman who's struggling significantly. 
She's a mom with a young daughter. Knowing their struggles, he contacted our food pantry coordinator and loaded them up with food. He didn't stop there, though. He also invited her to our Easter breakfast and service. This is the type of invitation that has the ability to scare away folks, right, who aren't familiar with church. So he was so kind and gentle and welcoming in his invitation that she and her daughter came. Mama was very nervous and a bit fearful and it showed on her face. She relaxed throughout breakfast and with a bit of leftover anxiety stayed for Easter service. For what I saw throughout service, the Lord was working on her. The gospel seeds were praying, were being sown and were praying for harvest. The story of the Methodist movement is that the people of God gathered every week and they cared for their souls and one another's. And that ignited something a deep level of powerful love in that congregation. And when a congregation has that experience of God's love, God loves to bring people into that atmosphere, right? I think a lot of us have been in church for so long. We have forgotten how hurting people are out there and how rare is love out there. Let us be that place, church. Let us be that people. I just share those stories to remind all of us that the world is really looking for Jesus. Whether they know it or not, people are looking for Jesus. And we get to share him. We get to be the body of Christ, the voice of Christ, the hands of Christ, the feet of Christ. What a beautiful thing. Well, we're gonna end this service. I see that I'm at the top of the hour and I'm gonna have Carrie um, just play. By the way, it is well with my soul is perfect. Carrie, thank you. And uh, I'm I'm gonna have a dismissal prayer right now. And if you need to get up and leave, uh, please exit the space quietly. Uh, you can do your sharing out in the other part of the room. Some of you may want to linger today, and maybe you'll want to stay in your pew and just get quiet before the Lord and say, okay, God, what, what are you saying to me? What does this mean for me? You may want to come forward and use the altar this morning, and uh, I will be up here, and your pastor, Pastor Rob, will be here, and if you'd like either one of us to pray for you, let us know. We'd be happy to pray with you and for you. But uh, for now, would you please stand with me? And uh, I want to send you off with a blessing. Lord God, we're reminded in the book of Revelation, the stories of the churches in Asia, that you walked among the churches. (laughs) You're present when the people of God gather. You know every heart, every mind, every story, and yet you walk amongst us great love. Thank you. I pray for this congregation, Lord, that as we uh, are dismissed here in just a few moments, that people would be washed anew in the love of God, that they'd feel deeply God's love for them, his passion, his deep love, that they would allow that love to seep in everywhere into their lives, that we'd go forth from this place, being people marked deeply by love and faithfully demonstrating the love of God to all the people we encounter. And we pray this now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.